Thank you for joining us. My name is Catherine Baxey. Today we're going to be looking at some of the key proposals in the Government's consultation on legal aid reform published in November last year. The paper sets out potentially radical changes that the Government says are designed to ensure that legal aid is targeted at those most in need. It comes at a time when the country is facing serious financial challenge. As part of the government's programme to reduce the fiscal deficit, the Ministry of Justice has to reduce its £9 billion budget by 23%. The legal aid budget has to deliver savings of £350 million. These reforms are naturally geared towards achieving this. To discuss the potential problems of the proposals for the public, the profession and for access to justice and to consider the Law Society's response, I'm joined by Andrew Kaplan, who's a consultant at Able Solicitors and Chair of the Law Society's Access to Justice Committee, and by Richard Miller, Head of Legal Aid Policy at the Law Society. Andrew, I'd like to start by asking you to briefly outline some of the main proposals. Well, there's going to be great changes in legal aid, great changes in the way that the legal aid system is run in this country and who's eligible for it. It's going to be bad news for practitioners, for the legal aid practitioners, solicitors, who have actually looked after clients for many years. It's going to be even worse news for clients because it's going to be a real access to justice problem in this country. The main areas that the government are thinking of is firstly cutting scope. That means the number of cases which actually can be funded by the legal aid system. Some things which are currently funded will no longer be funded. Secondly, there's going to be a change in financial eligibility, which will mean that some people who are in scope, their cases actually are covered by the legal aid system, will no longer actually be able to get legal aid because they will be financially ineligible. Thirdly, there's going to be cuts to fees, and that's bad news for the profession because there hasn't been an increase in fees for many, many years. I don't think this millennium, actually. Fourthly, they're suggesting some form of telephone gateway, which will be the first port of call in many circumstances for people taking civil legal aid advice. And finally, they're thinking, realising that there's going to be an access to justice problem about bringing some further funding into the system. But those ideas for further funding really don't add up. Richard, the funding of many family cases will see significant changes. Can you talk us through those proposals? What the government is proposing is that all family private law work will be taken out of scope unless there is domestic violence or a forced marriage in the case. And this has a number of problems. First of all, there is a very narrow definition being used for domestic violence. This trigger will only apply if there have been injunction proceedings or there is an existing order or there have been criminal proceedings relating to violence against the family. This is a much narrower definition than the ACPO definition that is usually accepted in government circles. Even on its own terms, the test omits a number of important uh, situations, such as where there has been an undertaking given rather than there being an injunction order uh, in place. And secondly, it doesn't cover the situation where uh, there are uh, criminal proceedings underway, but that there is no conviction as yet. So those are some serious omissions that would mean many victims of domestic violence would not get the benefit of this exception, even though clearly this is what the government intends here. There are a number of other problems with the restrictions for family funding. Uh, where the court makes a Rule 9.5 order, which means there is a dispute between parents about the child, but the court has serious concerns about the child's welfare, in those cases funding will be available for the child's solicitor but there will still be no funding for the parents in those cases, despite the fact that the court is looking at serious concerns about the parents' behaviour and its effect on the child. There will still be funding available for mediation, but the question remains, for those cases that are not suitable for mediation or where mediation breaks down and does not deliver an outcome, what are those clients supposed to do after that? Because there will be no further funding for them. They will either become litigants in person within the court system or they will be left without any remedy at all. And a number of other large areas of law are being taken out of scope. What are they? There are several areas that are coming out of scope completely, including clinical negligence, education, employment, debt cases unless the client's home is at risk, and many cases in the housing field uh, and also in asylum 
uh, sorry, in immigration. Um, Non-asylum immigration work will be coming out of scope entirely, except for circumstances where the client is in detention. And the government is also proposing to take out of scope the work on asylum support, which is where an asylum seeker has nowhere to stay and is sleeping on the streets and is looking for accommodation. So there's a large number of areas there that are coming out of scope entirely, and we believe there will be many cases there where serious injustice is caused as a result. And Andrew, why are these cuts so bad? Well, there's two reasons, really. I think the first reason is that people will not be able to exercise legal rights that they used to be able to exercise because legal aid will not be available, because so many areas will be cut out of scope that they'll have no legal redress. What you end up with is a situation where if you have the money, you might actually have redress. If you don't have the money, you don't have access to the courts, you can't enforce legal rights and obligations. I mean, the other downside, of course, is for practices of solicitors, who for many years, at very low rates, have actually looked after members of the community. And then suddenly they find that areas of work that they used to do, they won't be able to get paid for anymore. And of course, the result of that will be is that many will go out of business, which will mean there'll be less people able actually to help people with legal problems, even on a voluntary basis. It's bad news all around. Andrew, you mentioned earlier the telephone gateway. How will that work? Well, this is an idea that everybody who used to have civil legal aid advice for areas which still remain in scope now going forward will actually have the right to actually phone a telephone line and get some advice over the phone. And this would be the first port of call for most people seeking civil legal aid advice, except in emergency cases, but there's no definition of emergency cases at present. And what are the problems of it? I actually know this from a personal level, because for a number of years I helped run a telephone advice scheme in Southampton. And this scheme was whereby people could phone in and get some legal advice over the telephone. There are some advantages to having such a scheme because the first port of call and people perhaps can get some basic advice and be pointed in the right direction as to where they should go after that. But telephone advice is not suitable for many people. And as a lawyer, as a solicitor of a number of years' experience, I know that generally I like to see a client, I like to go through documentation with a client and actually have the benefit of them being there with me so we can talk over issues. And sometimes we can isolate issues which the clients don't know are underlying or what the problems are. I'm actually very cynical about the telephone gateway because I think that the government are embarrassed by the fact that they're cutting so much of legal aid and taking so many areas out of scope. And I cynically think that they've looked very carefully at the European Convention of Human Rights, realise what they have to fund and what they don't have to fund. But then as a sop to members of Parliament to perhaps have some concerns, they're going to say, but we've got this wonderful telephone scheme that everybody can go to as their first port of call and get the same sort of advice as they used to be able to have in the past. And maybe I'm being cynical, but there could be something behind that. Another concern that I do have is that what you might find is, is that so many firms of solicitors are unviable because they're not taking the clients as they did in the normal way, that local access to justice, local ports of call for people to go, even in the emergency cases, which they say will still be available, not via the telephone gateway, they'll have no one to go to and there could be a breakdown in legal aid services right the way through the country because of this. I'm very, very concerned about it. I know Richard thinks that there's one or two silver linings. I'm not so sure, but I'm sure that he might have something to comment on that. So, Richard, despite Andrew's reservations, what are those silver linings? What are the possible advantages of this approach? Well, first of all, I should stress I do share Andrew's concerns that there are many clients for whom the telephone service simply will not be appropriate and, and there are major problems with it. But if the government is determined to go down this route, I can see a number of possible benefits to solicitors that might come out of the system. First of all, for the last few years, solicitors have suffered with major problems relating to the number of matter starts granted to them under their contracts by the Legal Services Commission. And if you have a telephone gateway that is filtering out all but the cases that genuinely need to go to a solicitor, then in my view you would no longer need matter starts, so solicitors would be free to take on any clients who came through their doors. Secondly, it seems to me that it should be possible for the telephone service, as the first port of call, to undertake the means test. And if clients are referred to solicitors pre-approved on both merits and means, 
that would save a lot of unpaid administrative time that solicitors currently have to spend. And so that could lead to the system actually working more efficiently for solicitors. And the third point is that if many of the more simple and straightforward cases are handled by a telephone service, then it is likely that the average hourly rate that solicitors get paid for the work that does come their way will be higher because either they will be the more complex cases um, that are about to go onto a legal aid certificate um, or there may be uh, just a small amount of work that needs to be done at the legal help level uh, which would mean that the, the fixed fee may be uh, more beneficial in those cases as well. So it's quite possible that although a lot less work will be coming through to sol solicitors that that work will be paid on average at a slightly higher rate, making their businesses more economically viable. I mean, another problem that I see, I mean, I take what Richard says, I still disagree, I don't think there's any benefits in it, but another problem that I can foresee is, is that somebody actually needs proper advice and it's recognised that they need face-to-face -face advice from the telephone interview. Where do they go to? How do they get referred to a firm from there on? I mean, do they get referred to a chosen firm? Is there going to be a referral fee payable or anything like this? There's just no detail behind this. And I certainly think that if the government are thinking of actually going down this area more so, then they're going to have to have another consultation because there's so many gaps in this. Richard, another key change concerns financial eligibility. What are those proposals? First of all, there is a proposed change to income eligibility rules. There will be no change to the level at which clients are asked to make contributions, but there are proposals uh, for increases in the amount that clients have to contribute. And there are two proposals. One relates to increasing the amount they pay in each of the three bands that exists. And the second one is to abolish the bands and just take a flat rate contribution of 50% of the client's disposable income. At the moment, something like 25% of offers of legal aid subject to a contribution are turned down, and the vast majority of those, it's because the client can't afford the contributions. So clearly, if you increase the contributions, that's going to lead to a significant increase in that problem. There are also some very significant changes to the capital eligibility rules. First, at the moment, any clients on means-tested benefits are automatically passported through on capital, so they automatically qualify for legal aid, and that rule is going to be abolished. The second proposal is that any client who has capital of between £1,000 and £3,000 will be asked to pay a flat rate contribution of £100. At the moment, nobody with capital less than £3,000 has to make any such contribution. And the third, and perhaps most significant change of all, is that from now on, when calculating a client's capital, the equity in their home, if they are a homeowner, will be taken into account. At the moment, up to £100,000 of equity is disregarded, and that means that most homeowners do still qualify for legal aid at the moment. And what is the effect of the changes to the capital rules likely to be? There are some significant changes that come about as a result of the combination of these proposals. So the £100 contribution from capital might not be a big issue if you were only talking about liquid capital. But if the capital that you're talking about is the equity in someone's home, then whether they're on means-tested benefits or on incomes low enough to qualify for legal aid, it's difficult to see where they will find £100 from. But perhaps even more worrying is that for those who are on means-tested benefits, if the equity in their home is taken into account, it means that any homeowner on income support or other means-tested benefits will be financially ineligible for legal aid and they will not be able to come back in under the government's proposed exceptional funding test which applies only to the scope of legal aid not to the means test. So it seems to me this would be guaranteed to lead to circumstances that will breach the European Convention on Human Rights where people who under that convention should be provided with representation will fall outside the scope of the scheme. Aside from altering the way lawyers are paid, the paper looks at changing the way experts who give evidence in court cases are paid. What are the changes there? This is an area that has been of concern to the profession for some time. While legal aid lawyers are often paid at rates in the region of 50 to 70 pounds an hour, the experts operating under the legal aid system can sometimes be paid 150 to 250 pounds an hour, sometimes even more than that. 
and there's long been a feeling that many experts are being paid quite exorbitant rates for relatively routine reports. So it's an area that the lawyers have long wanted to see tackled and this paper does propose some first steps towards that. First of all, there is going to be codification of the rates paid for routine and common tasks and there is going to be a reduction in the benchmark rates of around 10%, so that should bring some immediate savings from the amounts paid to experts. Secondly, in the longer term, the government is proposing moving to more fixed and graduated fees for experts' reports, and there is a structured proposal for this contained as an annex to the Green Paper. So there are some positive proposals here for bringing some control to the payments to experts that's been missing for so long. Now, Andrew, legal aid is currently entirely funded through tax revenue, but the paper is looking at a couple of alternatives to bring in additional money to the legal aid scheme. The first looks at harnessing money from lawyers' clients' accounts. How will that work, and is it a viable su suggestion? Well, firstly, it's a bit like a tax on the legal profession. As many people who are listening to this will know, is we have client accounts and that's where our client funds go and most of the interest that earns on clients account has to go back to the client. We do benefit in some ways, we do actually able to keep some of the interest, particularly because interest is pooled because it gets more money on a higher amount of clients account money. We also benefit by the fact that we can do better deals with our banks because we have higher amounts in clients accounts. But what the government is suggesting is that we either have one or two options here. One is that there is a central fund which all solicitors' clients' account money gets paid into and then the interest on that is taken by the government to help fund the legal aid system. I mean, it's a tremendously idea, I really think, actually, because if you had a situation whereby this sole account was responsible for all the monies coming in and out, on a completion day, say a Friday before bank holiday, if the computer system went down, you'd probably have removal vans all the way up the motorway waiting for telephone calls and to let them know that the government system was back online again. So there's a big problem with that. The second suggestion, however, is, is that solicitors voluntarily have to pass on the interest extra that they earn into the central fund and then that's used to actually pay for legal aid, a bit of a top up. I don't see why that should happen really and the idea that that might be made a disciplinary offence if solicitors don't do it, if solicitors want to do it voluntarily that's another matter but to have a mandatory saying that if you don't pay this in you're going to have disciplinary proceedings taken against you, I, I don't think that's right, it's just a tax on the profession. Well, what about the second proposal, the supplementary legal aid scheme, taking uh, money from the damages uh, that clients who've, who've been funded by legal aid? Well, um, this is, read my lips, many more taxes, I think. This in a sense is having a tax on successful claimants. You know, why should they have to pay part of their damages to actually fund other actions? The whole idea under English law, we don't have punitive damages in the way they have in America. The idea of damages in this country is to put people back into the place that they would have been if an accident didn't happen or a claim did not have to be made. And the idea that some of that money should then have to go to fund other actions because the government feels unable to fund legal aid properly, I think is wrong. So what other options for reform does the government have, given the imperative to save money? I don't know what other options they have other than to fund it properly. But what I can say is that we at the Law Society are actually putting forward our own proposals, and I'll go into those if you would like. We were well aware that this was on the agenda, and so over the last 18 months the Law Society has been conducting its own Access to Justice review. And I will stress that this is Access to Justice. It's a genuine concern about people who would not be able to fund themselves in legal actions if what we thought the government were going to do did take place. And this is a proposal that we know is coming forward. In the Law Society's Access to Justice Review, the final report of which was published on exactly the same day as the Green Paper, we make a number of proposals. I mean, one is we're trying to actually say that you look at where the costs are coming into the Legal Aid Fund and actually take the costs from that particular area. So, for example, a levy on the Financial Services Authority, because so many of the very high cost cases, and they take up a great proportion of the Legal Aid Fund, are actually financial services cases. Now, there should be a levy on the members of that authority to actually pay for those sort of cases. The second idea that we've had is, is that there should be a tax on the alcohol industry. 
I mean, if you're a criminal lawyer, you know very well that six out of ten cases that you see in the magistrate's court or the police station or whatever are alcohol fueled. And I know there's a lot in the papers currently about how cheap alcohol is and there should be a minimum price and things like that. And there's also talk that there should be a levy to play for policing. Well, if there's going to be a levy on the alcohol industry to play for policing, it's only sensible that there's also a levy to pay for the defence costs as well. And we actually are pushing that. What I have said, though, a few moments ago, is that we are looking at to where the drivers of the costs of legal aid are. In a perfect world, in a perfect society, there would be no need for legal aid lawyers. Jack Straw in the last administration said so many times that we spend more per head on legal aid than anywhere else in the world. And he used that to say that this is a bad thing. Firstly, I think it's a good thing. The fact that we did have a bigger legal aid budget than anywhere else was something to be proud of. It showed that we have taken our idea of access to justice so, so seriously. But there's also something else as well. Because the drivers on legal aid are when there's matrimonial breakdowns, when there's difficulties with public authorities, when housing is not in the same in the way that it should be under the fair home standards, when there's clinical negligence problems, when there's problems in the street, whatever, it perhaps is an evidence of a broken Britain. And maybe the drivers behind legal aid are the fact that society has not been working as it should do. And the government should actually put its attention to that rather than try and cut at the very end. If the government had a more holistic view and looked at what was driving all of this and tried to do something about that, then there wouldn't be need for legal aid, there wouldn't be need for legal aid lawyers. It's like looking at something through the wrong end of the telescope and getting the wrong answer. Richard, the consultation closes on the 14th of February. What's the likely timetable from there? There are a number of steps we can expect over the coming months following on from this green paper. The first is that the paper itself does say there will be a further consultation on price competitive tendering for crime, which will be issued in the spring. Now, this will be about the fourth consultation on this subject in the past six years, so it's difficult to know why they think they can get around all the problems that have stopped the previous attempts this time round, but we will look with great interest at the proposals when they come out. The next step, as far as the main bulk of the proposals is concerned, is that there will be legislation, and we understand that that's likely to be brought in the early summer, and will be going through Parliament over the autumn and into the early part of 2012. During the course of this year, there will have to be a tendering process for family contracts. The current contracts are due to expire in November this year, and there will have to be something to replace them. This will, however, be an interim contract because the proposals in the Green Paper will not be ready to be implemented at the time that that renewal happens. We then expect to see the bulk of the changes come in either late 2011 or early 2012. Given the long history of timetables slipping, I would not be surprised if what actually happens is that there is a tendering process during 2012 for the changes to happen in 2013. And finally, Andrew, what is the Law Society doing to shape the outcome of the changes and what should the profession be doing now? Well, as I've mentioned to you, there's the Access to Justice Review. We're trying to make all members of the Law Society very well aware of what's going on here. We're trying to persuade them to put in responses because government, yes, it's the quality of the responses, but it's also the quantity of the responses which might make some changes, for, exa for example, to some of the areas which I think have taken out of scope. We're obviously lobbying Parliament, and people out there can actually lobby their own MPs, particularly those in marginal constituencies, and remind them that if they don't actually do something about this, then members of Parliament's constituency surgeries are going to be full up. I mean, the message that I would have at the end of the day is also this, is that the Law Society have tried to take the lead on access to justice over the last 18 months, two years. And a lot of the stuff that's come out from the Law Society has been on that basis. It's a genuine concern that access to justice in this country has been eroded. And I think there's a lot of people out there who do realise that the Law Society have taken lead on this. It was the reason why they took the action on the civil family tender last year. Access to justice, in my view, is the most fundamental of human rights. We talk about education, education, education. We talk about health. But we forget that access to justice 
is something that's a grained rock behind all of this. If you don't have access to justice, you can't have proper health services, you can't have your education, education, education. And maybe there needs a debate out there as to how important justice is in this country and how it's going to be eroded if these reforms go through. On that note, we're going to have to leave it. Andrew Kaplan, Richard Miller, thank you both very much. Goodbye. <laughs>